Welcome everyone. This is Fosfo and Braincast for Most and Learning. It is Monday indeed. Not that it makes any difference anymore. You know, they, the virus made a glorious comeback in the last couple of weeks. The risk escalated and London was placed in tier two, meaning that weekdays and weekends do pretty much the same. So last week, we explored the admittedly fascinating properties of Ayahuasca, alongside the man that set up a research center in the depth of the Peruvian Amazon, Dr. Simon Rado. This week, we land back to reality. Jump on the train to Houston Station and walk in the corridors of historic UCL. There we find a passionate researcher in love with a tiny, a tiny molecule destined to make our lives more exciting. Glutamate. She spent years and years measuring glutamate in the brain using neuroimaging techniques alongside Dr. Alice Egerton and Professor Philip Maguire, who both, I'm pretty sure you've all heard before, if you have even a remote interest in actress and first episode psychosis. She now spends her time alongside the one and only Professor Tony David, whose book, Into the Abyss, I can't recommend enough. Braincast people, this is Dr. Kate Merritt. Kate, thank you for joining me today. Hey, hey, Cosway, how are you doing? All good, all, I mean, all good. Anyway, not that good, but okay. So let's start with the basics. What is glutamate? Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Um, glutamate has lots of effects on the body. Um, it's involved uh, in metabolic function, but it has a separate role in the brain as an excitatory neurotransmitter. Um, glutamate also has a sensory role basically because it tastes really delicious. Um, so many of you have probably eaten it in the form of monosodium glutamate, also known as MSG. Um, a lot of people have it in for MSG, but I personally absolutely adore MSG. And um, I can reassure you that uh, it's been scientifically confirmed that eating MSG does not affect your brain levels of MSG. So uh, you have the official go-ahead to keep eating MSG. <laughs> Fantastic. So looking into, you know, how our understanding of psychosis has evolved over the years, it becomes clear that, you know, following the, the discovery of promising back in the 50s, the psychiatry of psychosis was pretty much revolving around dopamine. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, you know, that's understandable to some extent. But it was somewhere in the 90s, following a now classic paper by Javid and Zuki at the American Journal of Psychiatry, that, in a sense, it brought a different perspective. They talked about the psychedelic model of schizophrenia, essentially bringing glutamate in the forefront. So tell me more about this. So essentially, uh, Javid and Zuki gave PCP, uh, also known as angel dust, or ketamine to people and observed that the behaviours they elicited were similar to some of the symptoms we see in schizophrenia. So this led them to question what is the mechanism of action of these drugs? Um, and maybe this can give us a clue as to what's happening in patients. So they found out that ketamine and PCP block the NMDA receptor. Yeah. Uh, and this is the receptor that glutamate normally signals through. Um, so they hypothesized in schizophrenia there may be hyperfunction of the NMDA receptor. Um, and th this hypothesis is backed up by other lines of evidence, not just drug evidence. Um, so a lot of the risk genes associated with schizophrenia converge on glutamatergic targets. And more recently, very interestingly, um, was the discovery of anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis. So this was um, publicized a lot by Susanna Cahalan, who was a New York Times reporter who had uh, this type of encephalitis herself. Um, and it's when the immune system attacks the NMDA receptors. And the symptoms associated with it are extremely similar to schizophrenia, um, so much so that people who often present with this are referred to psychiatric wards. 
And I do know that in SLAM, now everyone presenting with a first episode uh, of psychosis is tested um, for these antibodies. Um, so you can see there are several lines of evidence which show if we mess around with the NMDA receptor, it seems to produce similar symptoms to what we see in schizophrenia. Wow. So don't mess around the NMDA receptor. Don't mess around with it. Which, of course, you know, it makes scientists and clinicians around the world, you know, really excited whenever we find find out that, you know, something else, you know, may be triggering, you know, these experiences. So what we all did, we started measuring glutamate in people's brains. So how, how, how do you do that? Yeah, you're right. So we've got the theory, but we need to actually test it. You know, is, is glutamate or NMDA receptors, are they different in people with schizophrenia? Um, so if we wanted to look at the NMDA receptor directly, it would make sense to maybe use PET, um, because with PET imaging, we can use a radio ligand that directly binds to the NMDA receptor. And so we would maybe expect to see reduced binding in people with schizophrenia. Um, but they're still developing a radio ligand that binds to the NMDA receptor. So Dr. Katie Beck at the IOPPN, she is currently looking into a new radio tracer. So we might be on the cusp of being able to use this in schizophrenia. Wow. But until now, we've had to make do with MRS, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, so MRS, it only requires an MRI scanner and it takes about eight minutes. Um, and in a nutshell, without getting into the physics, different metabolites, metabolites vibrate at different frequencies. So we can kind of pick up the signature of glutamate and measure the concentration in a region of the brain. Wow, okay. So essentially in the end, you're ending up with something like a graph and you know the taller the peak the more of that thing you have in your brain right yeah exactly fantastic okay so fast forward then to 2020 and there are now more or less something like 60 published magnetic resonance spectroscopy studies of glutamate metabolites in individuals with established psychosis or schizophrenia or at least for developing a disorder one of which weirdly enough is mine yes yes thank you the results, though, are far from homogeneous. So what's happening to glutamate levels in psychosis? Are they up? Are they down? What's happening? OK, so if you'd asked me this question maybe even a year ago, I would have said to you um, that glutamate levels are elevated in schizophrenia. Um, and this, this fits uh, the original models, um, which basically say that NMDA receptor hyperfunction occurs on GABAergic interneurons, and GABAergic interneurons are the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. Um, so this essentially means that uh, the off switch doesn't work anymore, um, and it causes excessive glutamate release, um, which can be neurotoxic. However, recent studies are beginning to show reduced levels of glutamate in schizophrenia, um, so this means we need to have a bit of a deeper look um, at glutamate levels in schizophrenia. Um, maybe we shouldn't assume that they're stable. Well, so which essentially, I mean, what I'm hearing is that if they're not stable, means that maybe glutamate levels are dynamic. So what brings them up and down there? So we've just uh, performed a multi-center analysis. It's not published yet, but we wanted to look at maybe if demographic or clinical factors uh, affect the levels of glutamate in schizophrenia. Um, so before we did this multi-center analysis, we knew that some studies reported lower levels of glutamate in more chronic schizophrenia patients. Um, and, and people thought this might be due to greater age-related neurodegeneration in schizophrenia. Um, however, we didn't find this. Um, instead, we saw that glutamate levels reduced with age in healthy volunteers and in patients with schizophrenia. Um, but what we did see was that higher doses of antipsychotic medication is associated with lower levels of glutamate. Um, mm. So maybe this explains the lower levels we're seeing in patients. Um, we also looked at symptom severity. Uh, we found that higher levels of glutamate are associated with more severe symptoms. And this is consistent with the finding that treatment-resistant patients have higher levels of glutamate than treatment responders. Um, 
one other review which I think is quite interesting in helping us answer this question uh, is by Lina Palaniapan. Um, so he's written a really interesting review. It's on my Twitter feed if anyone wants to find it. Um, talking about dynamic glutamate levels during the course of illness. And he yeah. proposes that a reduction in glutamate might be compensatory um, to counteract the hyperactivity we see in the hippocampus at the onset of disease. So even though this might be helpful, uh, maybe this compensation goes too far and this might lead to negative symptoms and treatment resistance and schizophrenia. Wow, I mean, that's, that's to be honest, that sounds really complex. But, you know, my question is when all these changes are happening, I mean, there is a paper by Nakazawa back in 2017. So they talked about disruptions in NMDA function during different temporal windows in brain development, and that these may contribute to the risk for someone to develop schizophrenia. So, my question is. Is glutamate dysfunction present at the time of onset of the symptoms or even earlier than that in the development? So I think it would be great if we had a few more longitudinal studies to really break this down. But from the research so far, it does seem that glutamate is high at the onset of disease, particularly when uh, people are symptomatic. Um, but you are right, we can look a bit earlier than this and start looking in the prodrome. Mm. Um, so to do this, we examine people at high risk of developing schizophrenia. I think Gemma mentioned uh, these people in her talk. Basically, it's um, people who are experiencing attenuated psychotic symptoms or they may be at genetic high risk and they're also showing a reduction in functioning. Um, and so research in these groups actually led to the NHS opening dedicated clinics um, for high risk groups. Um, so because this is a more recent field, there are spectroscopy studies in these subjects, but I do think we need a few more before we can be confident what is going on in the program. I see. I mean, you know, like, like a few other researchers, so Boson has offered a few papers talking about predicting who will develop psychosis based on glutamate levels. So let's assume that all these people arise, that, you know, I'm going to measure the glutamate in someone's brain, and then I can predict if and when they're going to develop psychosis. The when I'm not that sure about if they're going to develop in the future. So let's assume they're right. What can we do about it? So the the current services for these high risk groups they have been really successful in providing support to these young people and improving outcomes. However, two thirds of them don't actually develop psychosis, and so this limits the treatments that we can target in this group. Mm. Um, and so if we were able to predict who are the third of people who are going to transition to psychosis, um, this would allow clinicians to potentially target um, more treatments at these individuals. Um, I mean, the ultimate aim is prevention. It's so much better if we can prevent schizophrenia from ever coming than treating it when it comes about. So Boson study is quite exciting. You know, potentially we could use glutamate measures to uh, guide clinicians' care if we can use this to predict those who will transition. Mm. I mean, in the schizophrenia Buddhism paper, Stefan Lohitsky shows what you know, we all knew from clinical experience, that conventional dopamine-blocking antipsychotic medication is only partially effective. And in about a third, the overall response is pretty poor, meaning that glutamate may be an alternative target for drug development. In fact, you run a pilot trial of glycine trinitrate in the first episode of psychosis. So can, can you tell me a bit more about this trial? Yes, yeah, so we were looking at glycine trinitrate, GTN, uh, which is usually used to treat angina. So I know some of the doctors uh, thought our study was quite interesting, to say the least. Um, the reason we were doing it is because another research group um, we're looking at another type of nitric oxide donor. They were looking at sodium nitric oxide, but similar mechanism of action. And they saw these really beneficial um, effects on psychotic symptoms. So we were trying to replicate that. Um, mm. So we, we basically administered it on the early intervention ward uh, when people presented with psychosis. We found that GTM was very safe to administer. 
Um, it actually didn't affect blood pressure. It just increased heart rate a little, but the, the side effect pro profile is very low. And um, that's what we expected um, because with angina, the side effect profile is low. And that's why we wanted to test it. Uh, however, in terms of treating psychotic symptoms, uh, we really didn't see any beneficial results. Uh, <laughs> in fact, the, the placebo group did a little bit better. So um, GTN, although we had a very small sam sample size, it didn't look promising. And during the course of our study, two other studies published results looking at sodium nitroprusside, and they too didn't find any um, any beneficial effects of these drugs. So I think we can safely say that these two drugs, GTN and sodium nitroprusside, are not beneficial in schizophrenia. You can never rule out maybe there'll be another drug with you know still acting on the nitric oxide pathway, which may, may be beneficial. Uh, but at the minute, not these ones. But fair um, enough. Fair enough. You yeah. tried. You tried. And, and the truth is that, you know, glutamatergic neurotransmission is way more complex than just that, right? Meaning that there are several other ways that you could potentially modulate the glutamate levels. Yes, we have to be really careful when we're playing around with glutamate in the brain because it's the major excitatory neurotransmitter. You can induce epileptiform activity, uh, et cetera, or really affect learning and memory. Um, so we want to modulate it rather than directly influence it. Um, so for the NMDA receptor to be activated, uh, glutamate needs to be there, but also an amino acid called glycine needs to be present. Mm. So glycine usually just hangs out in the synapse. And so one potential treatment pathway would be to increase the levels of glycine, make sure they're always available. Um, by using a glycine transporter reuptake inhibitor. Um, one of the famous ones of these was called bitterpertin, but again, it wasn't very successful. Um, you could also try and target the metabotrophic glutamate receptors, but again, these have not been great. Um, in my personal opinion, this is just my opinion, but I think that maybe changes in glutamate and schizophrenia, although they are dynamic, um, I think they reflect a neurodevelopmental abnormality. Uh, I think this is why higher glutamate levels are associated with tumor resistance, because it indicates maybe more of a neurodevelopmental aspect rather than an environmental aspect, although these two things come together. And so I think if that's true, it will be harder to reverse a neurodevelopmental abnormality by drugs. So maybe this is why we've really not seen. Um, a lot of success in drugs targeting the glutamate system. Fair point. I mean, you know, part of me is thinking, you know, we, we spend you know, all this time talking about, you know, one molecule. So one tiny molecule, and then we have all these, you know, this complex, actually, lives. You know, we have patients, we have like, really complex symptoms like delusions and, you know, and thought disorder. So can someone view a molecule, any molecule, glutamate included, in isolation? And can a molecule directly translate to delusions and thought disorder and the complex presentation of a person suffering from psychosis? Yeah, I think that's a good point. We're talking on such a minute level here. It's important to step back and remember the whole disorder that we're talking about. Uh, and schizophrenia ultimately is you know, highly complex. Um, I, I don't think personally there is you know, a single causative gene or mechanism. Um, mm. But we can like view glutamate or dopamine maybe as the final step in this complicated pathway. And you know, this is useful for drug development. But I think we should also look backwards and question what is causing this. Um, so one candidate is likely to be adverse environmental factors, which we know are associated with increased schizophrenia risk. And I think surely these impact the brain to cause psychosis. Um, so I think this is a more holistic view. And so although drug treatment um, and drug development is very important, I think we should also look at preventative measures um, that reduce these adverse environments so we can stop schizophrenia from developing in the first place. 
which essentially brings us to your current work with, with Prof. David, right? We look into how, how social risk factors impact the brain development and how from there someone may develop psychotic experiences. So, so what exactly are we doing there? Yeah, so with, um, with Tony David, we're working on the Ausback birth cohort. Uh, and this is really great because there's so much data. So they have thousands of longitudinal measures from birth to adulthood in these people who took part. So we're focusing on individuals with psychotic experiences. So this is similar to the high risk group we were talking about, although they're at an even lower risk of actually developing psychosis, but they are at a greater risk of developing mental health disorders. Um, so the main part of our project is we're gonna be looking at longitudinal tra trajectories of brain development, which may occur before the onset of schizophrenia. So as I mentioned earlier, we do need a few more longitudinal studies to see what's going on. Okay. Um, we, we, we do have glutamate as well, but we're also gonna be looking at uh, white matter and gray matter. Um, and in the ASFAC cohort, it has been established that environmental factors such as bullying, trauma, urbanicity, cannabis are associated with psychotic experiences. So what I'm doing at the moment is just seeing whether brain changes mediate this association. So do the environmental factors actually impact the brain to increase psychosis risk? Fascinating, fascinating. So, so what I'm hearing is, you know, social factors and essentially science can have political implications. So if you're telling that social risk factors may you know, push someone to develop psychosis, essentially science can have political implications. So do you feel as a scientist that your voice is heard? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, I think it would be really great if we could like replicate the collaboration we have between academia and medicine and extend this to government and politics. Um, I feel like there are less frameworks, there are some, um, but it seems that we have great frameworks, you know, for drug development, but the lobbying for social interventions, it seems to be a bit more challenging. Um, mm. Ultimately, I don't think, I think a lot of charities, the charity sector have some really great ideas for social interventions. You know, I think as scientists, we uh, can highlight the risks and then charities can come up with interventions to reduce these risks. Um, I think, I think ultimately the problem is probably funding. Um, mm. I mean, so just just from work, yeah, just from working on the, the wards and the community teams whilst doing the research, um, you know, there were some really, really great um, interventions. I don't know if you heard this one called Raw Sounds, um, where they like bring music equipment, uh, you yeah. know, onto the wards or into the teams. Um, and, you know, some of the people we were working with you know, they, they dropped out of school and they're struggling to maintain their friendships. But this was something they seemed to really engage with. And but this these charities, they often the funding is a real issue. So I don't know. I don't know a way, but it'd be great to have more of a framework to so that government is aware of these really advantageous interventions and just make sure that they're always supported. Totally, totally agree. I mean, on, on a different note, you know, last week, I don't know if you uh you know, if you notice, but it was the, the Nobel Prize week. Uh, I didn't win any, uh, which, to be honest, I find really disappointing because I wasn't yeah. expecting my second. So I was reading about it, and it was Roger Penrose that shared the Nobel Prize in Physics with Reinhard Genzel and Adria Guess. And you would say, so what? Well, I'll tell you what. Angela Guess was only the fourth female winner in this category, the Nobel in Physics. So I was like, well, that's really weird. So I looked at it a bit more in depth and listened to that. And that's for all Nobel Prizes, right? So all Nobel Prizes throughout the years, 57 women and 905 male scientists. So how does that make you feel as a young female scientist? It's pretty demoralizing, I have to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but it's important to acknowledge so that we can try and change this. But, you know, it just makes you think of Rosalind Franklin and all these other women scientists whose work, you know, was overlooked. Um, and I do think there are reasons to be more hopeful now. Um, the number of, you know, female undergrads is, actually exceeds males in science. 
Um, and anecdotally, it seems that the, the PhDs, um, the number of men and women are the same. Um, the disparity really comes in when we start looking higher than that. Mm. Uh, if you've read the book um, Invisible Women, there are loads of scary statistics um, regarding gender disparity, not only in academia, but in, in all lines of work. Um, I, I, I hope that, you know, some of these women, the excessive women, we have a lot of women in these lower positions. And so hopefully over time, we will see this filter through. Um, but I don't, I think also we shouldn't be complacent. We really need to continue a lot of the great initiatives that have begun to try and address this disparity. So, um, you know, this disparity is it's occurring around uh, child rearing age. So I think that is quite a large thing we need to address. Um, I know UCL and Kings have um, brought in shared parental leave, which is really great. But I've also heard that the uptake is very low. So I think we need to have initiatives, but we also need to actually use them. Um, another consideration is, you know, uh, like the social networking aspect of a job is very important, but it's not something that we often overlook. Um, and so, you know, we attend conferences. That's how we get to know each other. Um, you know, this is pretty much how I met you, Cosmo. And so I think making sure we have equal access to that um, is important. So, you know, when you go to conferences, uh, you can get your expenses reimbursed. I think, you know, we should include childcare on that so that people, everyone can attend um, and just making conferences, you know, child friendly. You know, these are just very small things, but they really do build up. Um, and I think the work with unconscious bias when we're hiring and when we're promoting people, because ultimately we all hire in our own image. Uh, it's a bias we all have. Um, where in fact, it's good to remember that diverse teams are often the highest performing. So we just need to constantly challenge ourselves. Um, you know, we don't have to berate ourselves, but it's just questioning and it will lead to better outcomes uh, in the end. So uh, I also think that, I mean, I'm not gonna get into it, but I think race and class are also huge issues uh, in academia and in medicine. Um, I think, you know, really meaningful work at the admission stage uh, could go a really long way. Um, so I think we've made some progress, I really do, and I'm really happy to see the initiatives that we have, but we need to keep them going. So, so Kate, you've been working on how to, to better understand and treat psychosis for many years. Your studies may affect future treatments and the lives of people, yet you are not a medical doctor. So how do you envisage the role of scientists in the clinical management of patients? Essentially, is there a role for non-clinical scientists in a clinical, non-research setting? So a lot of what we've spoken about today is, you know, potentially using glutamate to predict if people will transition to psychosis and also to predict if someone's going to respond to a certain medication, you know, to avoid delays in taking meds that are never going to work for you. So if we are successful in this position, in this precision medicine, uh, using maybe neuroimaging measures, genetic measures, inflammatory measures, then maybe there could be a need for researchers, I don't know, advising on grand rounds, helping doctors to interpret this data. Um, I, I mean, that would be really nice because I really like the collaboration we have at the minute, but that would really be the next step. Um, you could see it on the other side, though, because maybe we'll just develop, you know, a risk calculator or a machine learning tool which just mm. spits out, you know, a risk number or spits out a category. Um, where, and clinicians will just use that to guide their care. So I, I'm not sure which way it would go. Getty, you, you, you're going to make me lose my job. Bring those people. <laughs> this is Dr. Katie. Thank you so much, Katie, and good luck with all your good summit adventures. As far as we are concerned, well, take your passports and your long coats as next week we'll be roaming the streets of Germany's capital. We're going to one of the most legendary university hospitals in the world, Charité in Berlin. And there we will explore the mysterious world of ticks and Tourette's. With me, the chair of the International Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Societies, Tick Disorders and Tourette's Syndrome Study Group, and the head 
of the movement disorders and body control lab, Dr. Christos Gamers. Until then, postdoc and brain test for mostly learning over and out. Bye.